know that we will do our best to answer any questions, but we are located in central Delaware and our volunteers have been trained to address local gardening issues. However, every U.S. state has a Master Gardener program, so be sure to look them up if you live in another state. Every year, the Kent County Master Gardener volunteers hold a plant sale. The proceeds go to scholarships for Delaware high school seniors and college students who are pursuing a college degree in some area of agriculture. We did not have a plant sale in 2020 due to the pandemic. If you would like to help us continue to offer these scholarships, please consider making a donation. Checks can be made out to Kent County Master Gardeners or KCMG and mailed to the address shown. We thank you for your support. This information will be included in the follow-up email you will receive after the workshop. If you have additional questions, you may call our helpline at 302-730-4000 or email us at kentcountyhelpline at gmail.com. Please check out our webpage on the Delaware State University website for future workshop listings, to register for workshops, or to view our virtual workshop recordings. And don't forget to complete the online evaluation. The link will also be put in the chat box at the end of the presentation. Thank you, and I will turn this over to our presenters at this time. Okay, welcome everybody. Our presenter today for our uh, Vegetables 101 series peppers workshop is Karen Abadi. Um, and Karen Abadi is the chairperson of our Kent County Master Gardener crew. And she is also a teacher and very active gardener. Um, so she has a lot of experience raising growing peppers that she wants to share with you today. So welcome everybody. And Karen, I will turn it over to you now if you wanna go ahead and start your share. Debbie. Welcome, everybody. Um, once again, I'm Karen Abadi. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to come celebrate Earth Day with us. What better way to celebrate Earth Day than to be attending a Vegetables 101 series course? Um, so thank you. Um, I really am um, very appreciative that you would take the time to join us today. Um, Today, we have a very short period of time to talk about a vegetable um, that I have grown every year um, with success, but also a vegetable that, um, that believe it or not, um, is grown um, widely across the United States. Um, of course, my husband in his infinite wisdom when I was talking about this said, well, how many peppers do you think people really grow? So of course, me being me, I had to look it up and found that um, in the United States alone, and this is based on 2017 um, census of agriculture that was completed, uh, we produced in the United States over 70,000 acres worth of peppers. Uh, and um, it's just amazing. There are in the Northeast alone, and again, um, I'm speaking to you from the Mid-Atlantic region, but in the Northeast, in 2017, there were over 7,000 acres of all types of peppers being grown on over 6,000 farms. And that's just in the Northeast. So it is a very, very popular vegetable. Um, oops, why am I not dancing here? Why is it that? Oh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so there's lots of different varieties of peppers. There's sweet peppers, there's hot peppers. They originated in Southern Mexico, Central and Southern America. Um, and actually the cultivation of peppers can be traced back thousands of years. Um, they think that um, Christopher Columbus actually um, found peppers in the West Indies, but they were not introduced to Europe until about the 16th century. Then they were found in South America, Spain, England, and the Caribbean until they were introduced here in Northern America. Um, they are thought, um, according to the Department of Agriculture, it is thought that bell peppers were first produced in the Southern United States in the mid 1920s. Um, so when we speak specifically, and, and just as an aside, the majority of the pictures in this presentation are actually from the peppers that I have grown in past seasons. Um, 
even some of the pests and diseases. So I speak from practical experience. And this is a photo from last year. Um, I've grown bell peppers, um, habaneros, uh, jalapenos, um, cubanelles, um, and, and bell peppers um, every year. When we speak to hot and sweet varieties, the pungency that we're referring to actually is found in the seeds. Um, and it is determined by the amount of capsation that is produced. And that depends on the variety. Uh, and there are also different types of capsation. Capsation might be something that you're familiar with in some of the um, over-the-counter liniments. I've seen it um, used over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, water and fertilizing also plays a role in the heat and the capsation level. When we talk about that heat level, you might have heard this before as well, um, the Scoville heat index. The Scoville heat index goes from zero to three million. Um, so you can get peppers all along that line. The mildest peppers are sweet bell peppers, banana peppers, cherry peppers. They're the sweetest. They're at the bottom of that Scoville index. Somewhere in the middle, you'll see serranos, uh, red cayennes, and yellow hot wax peppers. And then when we're talking about the top of that scale, something that I can't eat, um, my son-in-law does, but I do not, uh, you'll find serrano types, habaneros, chili peppers, and even ancho peppers. Commonly, there are about 20 peppers that we are um, familiar with, with um, here in the United States with cooking, but there are thousands of different types of peppers. Um, to grow peppers, you've got a couple of options. Um, you can grow from seed or you can pick up an already established plant. Um, I don't know that you can see it, but I have, no, you can't. I have um, my seedlings here with me. Um, this year I'm growing mini bell peppers. I don't know, it's a background, it's a bugger. So I've got a little bell pepper growing here. Um, I have golden bell peppers and I'm also growing purple peppers this year lilac peppers. Um, the seedlings um, generally take about 10 days to germinate. So you get the seeds, you put it in your potting mix, um, and it takes about 10 days for that seedling to come up out of that dirt. Because of the long growing season um, and the temperature requirements, it's recommended that you start seeds eight to 10 weeks prior to the average frost pre-date in your area. They cannot be put out in that garden, in that soil, until that frost has passed. Um, in our mid-Atlantic region here in Delaware, I always associate that frost date with Mother's Day. Uh, but you can check with your local cooperative extension, as I know we have people that are in other states attending today to determine that frost-free date. Um, so, so I started these quite some time ago. Um, once the soil has warmed in the spring, that's the time to set your seedlings out. Depending upon your area, uh, here in Delaware, I would think it would be a little too late to start from seeds, but in other areas of the country, perhaps not so much. When the seedlings are large enough to be handled, uh, you can trans them, transplant them um, out into your soil, but you'd want to have a hardening off period. Um, here um, with the Kent County Master Gardeners, there was a wonderful workshop done by one of my fellow Master Gardeners, Verna Thompson, that can be seen on our website, and we'll provide you with that link about starting plants from seed and the whole process of hardening off and transplanting. So I would refer you to that. Uh, as well as, again, your local cooperative extension. You're going to get sick of me saying that. Um, so at this point here in Delaware, if anybody is local, uh, I would recommend just um, getting a plant at this point. It's a little late to start from seed. Um, generally speaking, you can find transplants relatively easy at garden centers, local nurseries, perhaps the big box stores. Um, if you are buying transplants already established, 
plants, as I should say. Um, I would recommend looking for stocky, sturdy plants. Um, I would want you to find plants that have three to five true established leaves. You would want to be avoiding plants that have blossoms, flowers, or fruit too soon. Uh, you also want to avoid, and this is obvious, you want to avoid plants that are diseased or have insects. Look at the bottom of the leaves. Look at the underside of the leaves. And we'll talk about pests and diseases a little bit further. And, and we have some great images as to what kinds of things you would be looking at for that. But, <clears throat> excuse me, do a really good inspection of that plant um, before you pick it up. Um, there's a couple of things that are going to factor into your success growing peppers. Um, so we're really starting with the basics here. Peppers grow best in fertile, well-drained soil, and they are considered warm season annuals, and they self-pollinate. Now the self-pollination is a really cool concept. It means that they're gonna do okay if you put them in a container, perhaps in your screened in porch or on your patio because they self-pollinate. Um, with regard to pH, um, you see on the right side of your screen an example of a soil test that was done here for a grower in Delaware. Um, and if you send a soil sample to um, the University of Delaware um, soil sample program, an individual test will come back looking quite similar. For this, what I wanted to focus on is that red, white, and green section in the center, kind of looks like an Italian flag. Uh, the red meaning that is that soil is low on some nutrients, the medium and that white zone that you're okay, and the green meaning that nutrient you're optimal. I recommend sending off a soil sample um, at least every two to three years. Of course, it's all relative to where you're planting. But certain plants, not just peppers, require certain nutrients to be uh, in a good range. And you also need that soil pH to be in a good range. I plant my peppers in a raised bed. You'll see here this image to the left is my husband's raised beds where he had planted peppers. I also plant them in a more traditional setting down on the ground. Um, the raised bed, if I have changed the soil in the last year, generally speaking, I will not send off a soil sample. But if I'm in a uh, planting in a space where that soil has been there for quite some time, uh, more than two years, or if I've had problems in past years growing things, I will send off a soil sample. And again, we'll provide you that link. Um, at the end. With regard to peppers and pH, um, peppers are not necessarily particularly sensitive to soil acidity, and that's what we're talking about pH, is talking about acidity and alkalinity. Um, the best yields for peppers are in soil where the pH is between 6 and 6.8. The soil, um, the soil fertility um, can be adjusted if need be. Normally, we would recommend two to three months before you're planting there. That gives you time to amend the soil as is recommended by the soil test and for those nutrients to get in the soil. Um, and again, through uh, in Delaware, um, we do the soil testing through the University of Delaware but you can, in all regions, contact your local cooperative extensions, and I am sure they all offer these types of soil tests. Um, I have seen some gardening catalogs and websites offering, like, do your own soil testing. I can't speak to the validity of those. I've never used one of them. Um, and quite honestly, I would venture to guess that the cooperative extension um, probably is less expensive. But you have options. With regard to nitrogen, uh, which again will come up on your test, if there is too much nitrogen in your soil, 
from fertilizing, over fertilizing. That with peppers can promote lush vegetation. They look great, but you won't have a lot of fruit. That's the concern with that one. Um, phosphorus, you want phosphorus to be in a medium range. You don't want too little. Peppers need phosphorus for successful growth. Um, and calcium, again, a lack of calcium, and you will get this again, you'll see this on the last um, nutrient listed on the soil sample. A lack of calcium relative to peppers is going to contribute to a condition known as blossom and rot. And we'll talk about that condition a little bit further along as well. Also important to keep in mind is water and light. And again, these are some peppers you see here, a bell pepper on the left um, from my own garden last year. Watering is super important. You want your soil to have a uniform moisture. That's the goal with watering. If you have too much water, it's gonna to lead to conditions like blossom end rot or even southern death for a pepper plant. If you have too little water, you're gonna have small fruit. It can also cause blossom drop and yet again, uh, contribute to end rot, believe it or not. Peppers should receive one to two inches of water a week, a week. Um, so this amount can be achieved with rainfall. Um, it can be achieved by supplemental irrigation. So yet again, there's a lot of gizmos and gadgets that are sold um, to measure water. And I had a fellow master gardener friend who turned me on to the tuna can trick. It's simple, it's inexpensive, um, just a tuna can is two inches in height. Just put a can out in your garden and you can determine if you are getting that two inches of water every week by measuring the quantity of water in the tuna can. It's a really simple, basic, and effective way to measure that water. Um, if you're not getting enough water from rainfall, you're gonna have to supplement with irrigation. Drip irrigation and soaker hoses are really excellent ways to water pepper. You would want to soak the soil thoroughly, but you don't want to get water on the leaves or the plants themselves. That's why we recommend um, watering with soaker hoses or um, drip irrigation, because that's going down in the soil. Um, and again, so I have a daughter who just cannot wrap her head around this concept. She's out there with the hose going all over the place. And I keep saying to her, stop, stop, but I'm watering. Um, and you'll see the end result of this mess of throwing the hose all over the plants that happened to me last year. Um, so even if you're watering with a traditional hose and nozzle, please try and do it lightly and aim for the soil, not plants, okay? Um, frequent light watering throughout the, uh, the might encourage a weak root system, as crazy as that sounds. So again, a steady supply of water is needed for best performance. Yet again, looking at um, having that drip irrigation system or a soaker hose where those uh, plants are located. Um, Plants that are grown in containers, and peppers are an excellent plant to grow in a container, a pot. Um, oftentimes, because of that um, pot, they will dry out more quickly. So you might find if you have a pepper plant in a smaller container, it might need more frequent watering um, than you might in a traditional garden sense. With regard to light, um, Peppers are grown best in temperatures between 75 and 80 degrees during the day and 60 to 75 degrees at night. Um, that's why my babies haven't gone outside yet. It's still a little too cool in my area. They do enjoy full sun and they don't tolerate cold temperatures very well and certainly not frost. So if you get your plants out there and you find that there's some 
loopy sudden frost or a, a exceptionally cold evening in your area, you can utilize a row cover for that night to keep them covered and hopefully protect them from that frost and save them. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything fancy by any means. I've seen people use, um, you know, um, even boxes that are opened at the top to allow those plants to get light, but yet protect the plant from the frost. I've seen people use um, shower curtains wrapped around wire. Um, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. You can be creative with it. Um, so we've talked about the needs. Let's spend some time about the where, the when, and the how, the practical elements of planting those peppers. When you have to know your regional frost state. Set your transplants out when the soil is warmed. And just because the air in your area is warm, that doesn't mean that the soil has reached that temperature. The soil temperatures um, below 65 degrees will cause your pepper plant to just sit there. Nothing's gonna happen. It's not gonna grow, it's not gonna flower, it's not gonna mature until that soil temperature is 65 degrees or better. Um, so that's part of the reason why we suggest waiting until after the first frost has passed. That being said, yet again, there's all kinds of fancy gizmos and gadgets out there to measure soil temperature. I just take my meat thermometer and stick it in the soil. It seems to work just fine if you have one. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. I'm a big fan of free or inexpensive. Um, where? Where is a good site to plant your peppers? Full sun, but extremes in temperature are yet again gonna slow or stop the pod production on pepper plants. So then you're saying to yourself, well, Jiminy Crickets, how do I, how do I handle that one? You need to know your site. Um, as a fellow master gardener was pointing out in another presentation yesterday, now's a really good time to look at where you're planning to plant your peppers. Go outside and see during different parts of the day how much sun exposure there is. You might think, oh, this site is sunny all day, but maybe it's not. And I speak from experience, um, and not only with, with, with peppers, but everything I plant. I really learned the hard way. Um, for example, I have planters in the front of my house, and I put some flowers in them the first year I had them, and they didn't do well mm. at all. Well, it wasn't the plant's fault. It was a human error. I thought they got full sun. Well, guess what? Surprise, they don't. Um, so take the time to investigate the area where you're planning to plant your pepper. Um, raised beds are excellent. You can plant them in peppers, in, tra uh, in planters, traditional gardens. Um, what's important is you have a means to drain off any excess water that might accumulate. Not all um, raised beds and not all pots have holes in the bottom. So if that's not the case, just poke a couple of holes in the bottom of your, your planter if you're able to, to allow that drainage. Made that mistake too. Learned that the hard way because I had a swamp um, and it wasn't until after the swamp was created that I found out that I didn't have a hole in the bottom of my pot. Um, and that's easy enough to do based upon the material you have. Um, raised beds, um, oftentimes have excellent means to drain water, but just check it out. It's important to do these steps beforehand to have a successful growing season. Um, you would like when you're planting your peppers that they be spaced in staggering rows approximately 12 to 24 inches apart. When they're itty bitty little babies, that might seem like it's really far apart but when they get to be full size, you'll be appreciative of having that space in between. Um, if you're planting your peppers in a pot, it's recommended that it be a five gallon size minimum. The roots need that space to grow. Um, also, your pepper plants are going to need some form of support um, and you would want to put that support in early, whether you're using a cage or there's lots of ways to support plants in the garden, 
um, put it in when you're putting that baby plant in your vessel or your raised bed or wherever you're choosing to plant them. The thought being that when they are at this baby phase, by putting that support in now, you will not be disturbing the root system. If you're putting it in late in the game when the plants are needing that support, by putting that in, you might be damaging the roots and preventing further growth. With regard to once that plant is in, maintaining it, a couple of things to keep in mind. Everybody's favorite, weeding. I, I know we had somebody speak to our group once and they said, find a five-year-old. Five-year-olds love to weed. Personally, um, I don't mind weeding. I have a couple of options for weeding. You can do it by hand. Um, I find it's very, very good for my psyche. If I'm having a bad day, I'm going to pull some weeds. Um, if you are choosing to um, weed in a different method, you want your cultivation of that soil to be shallow. Okay, again, we're looking to not disturb the roots of the growing pepper. Um, you can also, upon planting, mulch around the plants. That might aid in some weed prevention. Um, and there's, again, there's a lot of things that are out there that can be bought. You can use straw. Uh, you can use untreated dried grass or um, dried leaves. Um, newspaper works well, cardboard works well, as long as it doesn't have color on it. Um, and of course there's black plastic mulch. Um, I, I have tried that, um, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so much. Uh, peppers have a long growing season. Um, so you're going to want to pinch off early flower buds and small fruits. Ultimately, that's gonna produce a stronger, more prolific plant. And again, um, you see here, I used cages one year. These cages are three feet tall. Um, and you see how much larger that bell pepper plant got. Um, so you're definitely gonna need some kind of support, uh, whether it be a trellis or a cage um, or what have you. So give some thought to that as well when you're planting your babies. With regard to fertilizing, I guess, again, the needs are going to be based upon your soil sample test results. Um, oftentimes you're going to need a light to medium fertilizer. Um, once the fruits have set, a fertilizer might boost productivity if it is needed in your soil. If you are planning to fertilize your pepper plants, it is recommended that you um, side dress with a 10-10-10. So by side dressing, I mean put it along the sides of the base of the plant, not directly on the plant itself. Um, if you are going to apply calcium, if you find that that is a need based on your soil test, that would have to be put into that soil three to four weeks before planting. So just something to keep in mind. Again, with side dressing, you wanna put that fertilizer four to six inches away from the base of the plant to prevent burning, okay? Um, and again, I know there are some fertilizers that are sold that um, are actually sprayed. Um, there's potential for burning the plant foliage if you're going to be watering overhead and using that fertilizer application overhead. We want to focus on the soil, okay? Keep in mind the soil. Um, so, pesty plants, um, aphids. When your plant is infected with aphids, uh, you see here, unfortunately, this is not an image from my garden. I got this image elsewhere, but I have had an issue with aphids. What do they look like? Well, they're small, these little soft-bodied insects. They could be green or yellow. Actually, they could span the gamut. They could be black, they could be pink, they could be brown. Um, it all depends upon the species and the host plant. Um, they will cause these, um, these um, like necrotic spots 
on the leaves, kind of a dark spot on the leaves. Um, you will see them on the underside of the leaf. Um, again, if you're going to a nursery, a box store, wherever you're going to purchase your plant, look at the underside of the leaf. And this image I liked because of that very reason. This is not the top of the leaf. The top of the leaf probably looks great, but when you turn it over, you see that it is infested with aphids and you surely don't want to be bringing that home. If you already have that plant home and you're finding that this is an issue, what can you do? Um, generally speaking, an aphid um, infestation is limited to a few leaves or shoots. So you can easily remove those leaves or prune that area out. Um, again, checking these transplants before planting. Um, some sites have recommended um, using a silver colored plastic will deter the aphids. I've never done that, so I don't know the efficacy of that. Um, easy enough, this is the one time that you will actually hear me say, spray your plants with water. Um, that strong stream of water will actually knock the aphids off the leaves. Um, insecticides, um, there are some insecticides, but they generally only work when the aphid infestation is very high. Um, another problem, this little guy is the bane of my existence. This Colorado potato beetle, and everybody will say, well, it's a potato beetle. Uh-huh, well, they love my eggplants. They love my peppers. They just love me. I don't know if I should be flattered or insulted, quite honestly. Um, these little guys, um, they are going to create damage to your foliage from feeding. Um, the infestation can be severe if it is left untreated. Um, they can completely defoliate a plant. I feel like it's overnight. I truly do. I mean, they are just speedy little son of a guns. Uh, you see here from this image, um, they can be black with yellow stripes. Um, the larvae are bright red with black heads. Um, the adult beetles will emerge in the spring. The female beetles will lay their eggs in batches up to two dozen. Um, the female can lay 500 or more eggs in a four to five week period. It's just mind boggling. So management, well, so what do you do about these guys? Um, it can be a challenge. Um, you can pick them off and squish them by hand. I've tried that. Um, in the home garden, um, that's often recommended is hand picking them. They are destroyed with a mild soapy water solution. Um, oftentimes it's recommended that you use um, some insecticides to, um, to control the larvae. And sometimes the insecticides are helpful against the adult beetles as well. Um, you can try some neem oil. And um, one thing I tried, which actually worked, was red pepper flakes, um, but it worked for literally overnight. Uh, they do not like the taste of red pepper flakes and it wasn't damaging. I try to grow organically, uh, so I avoid pesticides as is humanly possible. Um, so I'm going to those warehouse stores buying these huge containers of red pepper flakes and sprinkling them all over the place, but they won. They won the battle that year. Um, some additional conditions, and yes, this is my garden. Thank you very much to my daughter with the hose. Uh, this is what happened. Uh, you will see here um, in both images, some bacterial wilt, as well as bacterial leaf spot on the right image. These are two of the most common conditions that we find with peppers. Um, again, how do you get rid of these? How do you prevent this from happening? I'd like you to learn from my mistakes. Well, to reduce the disease problems, we wanna do things like um, if you had started from seed or you will be in the future, you want certified diseased free seeds or transplants. 
Also, you want to rotate plant locations. Um, do not plant peppers in the same spot that you have within the last two years. The same applies for planting peppers in the same place that you do nightshade vegetables, things like eggplants and tomatoes. That's where my mistake came into play. Um, the year that I had this problem, I had planted previously um, some nightshade vegetables in the same beds. Um, remove any plant debris from the garden site at the end of the growing season to limit any insect or potential diseases from the previous year. I made that mistake as well. Um, so again, these are caused by bacteria. Um, the upper leaves of the plant will wilt on hot days, but recover in the evenings or the early mornings. The affected leaves are gonna remain green on the plant, um, but you're going to see the vascular tissues in the lower stems become discolored. If there's a severe infection, you will actually see bacterial oozing from the stems. Um, it's really fascinating. These diseases can affect, as I had said, some of the nightshade vegetables. You'll see this with tomatoes, with potatoes, eggplants, even tobacco crops as well. Um, management, again, super difficult to control. Um, you can do cultural control things. Again, um, making sure that your plants or your seedlings are from diseased free uh, crops. Uh, you want to be mindful of irrigating. Again, irrigating the soil, not the plant. Um, also not excessively irrigating. As I had said earlier, you want the soil to be moist, but not saturated uh, because those conditions are favorable um, if you're over watering or if you're watering the plant itself for bacterial growth. And again, rotating um, your crops, even in a raised bed. Uh, that being said, if you are planting in pots, you would want to make sure your pots were cleaned in between seasons. Um, something again, I didn't know. Powdery mildew, I haven't gotten this one yet, but there's still time. Yet again, if you look at this image, you are gonna see patches of white powdery fungal growth on the underside of the leaves. These things are tricky, the tops look great. It's on the underside where you're going to see this powdery mildew. It can cause a yellow to brown discoloration on the upper edge of the leaf. Um, the leaves might curl upwards to expose the underside of the leaf, or they might even begin dropping from the plant. Powdery mildew is a fungus. Um, it can occur in dry conditions or humid conditions, and it spreads super rapidly in human, uh, humid conditions. Um, it's common in older leaves. I shouldn't say common. It can commonly affect older leaves on the plant. Um, management is truly just applying a fungicide if the disease is severe. Uh, and if you can catch it on some of those older leaves early enough, you can just prune them off. Yep, blossom end rot, miserable. Um, blossom end rot is caused by a calcium deficiency. And these are both images of blossom end rot. Uh, it actually affects the developing fruit of the plant. It results from the low levels of calcium in the soil. You can also see this occurring if there is a lack of soil moisture. So calcium is tricky. Um, calcium in the soil is actually taken up into the plant with the water. So if you're not having enough moisture in the soil, then those plants cannot absorb that calcium. Uh, and this is just, again, a very basic, um, a very basic calcium lesson. Um, so it can be tricky. 
You don't want to overwater your peppers, but you don't want to leave the soil so dry that they don't have the ability to take up that calcium. Um, so how do you prevent this from occurring, the blossom end rot? You need a consistent supply of calcium in the soil, clearly. Um, so how do you do that? Well, rich organic matter. What do we mean by rich organic matter? That's, that's a really fancy way of saying compost. Compost is great. Um, I put eggshells in my compost, you know, ground them all up and throw them in. Excellent source of calcium, free, easy to do. Um, you also wanna keep your soil uniformly moist, but not saturated. Do not allow the soil to become dry in between watering. And again, doing a soil test to see if your site has enough calcium in the soil. And we'll provide resources um, again about how you can get that done. Bacterial leaf spot is another thing you have to keep your eye out for coming from water-soaked lesions on the plants that subsequently dry out, forming these raised brown cankers on the stems or even on the fruit themselves. It is a bacteria. Uh, it favors warm, wet conditions, okay? Uh, think of it like, you know, when we come out of our shower or bath, our skin is all wet with little droplets. Well, we're able to towel it off. We're not after watering too much going and drying off each leaf. Um, so again, this is going to form on the undersides a lot of time on leaves, although these images are on the top side of the leaves because it's pretty severe for both of these plants. Um, it can enter a field um, from the seeds or even transplants. Um, so you want to be mindful again of where you're getting your plants. Go to a reputable site um, to get them or store. You can remove these leaves. That's probably the easiest thing to do. Uh, and again, not water overhead. Hopefully you'll be able to get it early enough that you can just remove the affected leaves and others are not affected, but uh, something to be mindful of. In addition, uh, peppers are susceptible to sun scald. And what I mean about sun scald is damage to the actual plant tissue due to excessive sunlight. So this kind of seems strange, right? So peppers love the sun, they need the sun, but again, they need the sun for energy, they need the sun for growth. Um, but if there is excessive sunlight to tender portions of the plant, say the younger leaves, the developing fruit, uh, they can actually develop this sun skull. Um, less developed skin of young pepper plants cannot tolerate full sun conditions in certain pepper varieties, okay? Um, the extreme in sun is going to cause injury similar to sunburn, but on your plants. Um, so again, it takes understanding the sunlight in the area that you're planning to put your pot or planning to put your little baby plant. Um, oftentimes sun scald is mistaken for other conditions in a pepper plant, but there are very defining characteristics for sun scald in peppers. It often starts as a white or even black discoloration on the fruit's skin. Um, these localized areas will become soft with time. Um, because of this, it leaves them more susceptible to some of the other conditions that we previously spoke about as well, even rotting of the fruit before it has even been picked. So how do you avoid this one, right? You want them in the sun, but you don't want them in the sun. Well, um, you want to plant where there are alternative shade options. For example, plant your peppers with plants that have larger leaves. So say for example, I'll plant my peppers, um, some, one year I planted them with um, a certain um, heirloom form of tomatoes um, and they were spaced but relative to the north and the east, 
later in the day when the sun was so strong, those um, heirloom pepper plants were providing some shade, uh, heirloom tomato plants were large enough that they were providing some shade to my pepper plants that were susceptible to sun scald, if that makes sense. Um, you can also provide a shade cloth if you're in an area that has extreme heat. Um, so being mindful of what you're planting and where you're planting. And it might seem crazy, but really doing all this front, upfront work will lead to your success with planting the peppers. Another potential issue is stink bugs. Um, so stink bugs, you see a lovely image of them here. Um, they are going to appear on your produce potentially. I've been lucky enough to not have this happen yet, but I'm sure it's only a matter of time. Um, while they are feeding, the stink bug is actually going to inject enzymes into the plant. In the case of peppers, as well as tomatoes, again, those sunshade vegetables, the areas around the feeding sites are going to have a different color. Um, it's going to be a hardened area. Um, you will see symptoms of stink bug damage manifesting as a malformation of the developing fruits. Small dimpled green areas on the fruit potentially, or even what we call cloudy spots on the fruit. Um, there might be areas where it appears white or even spongy. In terms of how to deal with this and manage this, um, you wanna keep the ground, the garden and the surrounding area clean and free of debris that might attract stink bugs. Things like overgrowth, weeds, old boards, things that might be hiding places for stink bugs. Um, I recommend natural repellents in the garden. Um, since these pests feed and lay their eggs on garden plants, you can try spraying with a mineral clay solution as a method for stink bug control. I haven't tried it, but this was something that was recommended um, through the cooperative extension. Um, the mineral clay solution actually prevents the bugs from laying their eggs and feeding on the plant, and it is safe for edible plants like pepper, and it washes off pretty easily. Um, you can also encourage beneficials in your garden, and you see listed here, common enemies of stink bugs, and we refer to these as beneficials. Um, stink bugs have natural enemies, um, things like um, the praying mantis, um, the lace wings, ladybugs, some spiders, um, toads and even some birds. They will come and they will eat the stink bugs and um, not hurt your garden. You can also consider laying plant traps. Um, using a decoy in the garden is often a great way to lure stink bugs away from your garden plants, but then others will say that they will, um, the lure of the traps will attract more. So, um, so I don't know. Um, some sites have recommended placing a garbage bag that's left for a few days in the sun and then disposing of the stink bugs. Um, stink bugs are especially fond of okra, corn, sunflowers, and mustard. If everything else has failed, um, then you can look towards pesticides. Uh, I would recommend looking for an organic pesticide method things like neem oil or an insecticidal soap. Um, some people have had luck with homemade nicotine solutions. I have read for stink bug, bug elimination. Um, that's essentially taking about half a pack of cigarettes, um, removing the paper and dissolving the tobacco in warm water and running this through a filter uh, with a little detergent and then putting it in a spray bottle. Uh, apparently, this is considered a poison to the stink bugs. Again, this is not something I have tried specifically, um, but seeing as we're looking at um, control on an edible, um, I want to be mindful of that. So harvesting and storage. Sweet and hot types of peppers um, 
normally are ready to be harvested about 70 to 85 days after they are transplanted into your garden. Um, some Southwestern and Mexican varieties, things like habaneros, poblanos, and serranos will take anywhere from 100 to 120 days to harvest after you transplant. And again, these are, these are pictures of, um, of my harvest here. Bell peppers usually get to be picked when they are green and immature, but full-sized and firm. Um, if you allow that plant to continue to ripen, it will continue to get sweeter and higher in vitamin content. Um, it all depends upon the type of pepper you're growing, okay? When you are harvesting, don't rip, and this goes for any varieties, don't grab it and pull it. Um, peppers have a very thick stem and they often are a little brittle. So cut the pepper off the plant. I made this mistake as well. So again, I speak from experience. You wanna use hand clippers or pruners uh, to avoid excessive stem breakage. The number of pepper plants, again, is gonna vary upon the variety that you are planting. A bell pepper plant can produce anywhere from six to eight or more fruit per plant. I've had great success. I mean, I've had far more than that. Um, Generally, peppers, when they are harvested, have a short lifespan, approximately one to two weeks. It is recommended that they be kept in cool, um, moist areas with um, some humidity as well. Um, you can dry them. Um, I have washed them and um, frozen them. And again, these are some of my harvest. Um, Essentially, you're harvesting when your pepper reached the desired color. And again, they'll increase in flavor and vitamin content the longer you leave them there. I did one year, I had so many jalapenos, I just couldn't keep up. And I ended up leaving them on the plant. Oh my gosh, they were the hottest things known to mankind. They were insane. That being said, please remember to wear gloves um, when you are handling hot peppers, you don't want to touch your eyes, your skin, your face, your nose, etc. When you are har harvesting those hot peppers, because um, it it burns, it burns. Um, so we're going to go have questions and answers in a few minutes, but there are commonly some questions that people will ask um, if you're going to plant bell peppers next to hot peppers, or any sweet pepper next to a hot pepper. Is that gonna make your sweet peppers result hot? No, um, peppers are self-pollinated. So they're not cross-pollinating between the hot and the sweet. So no, go right ahead. Absolutely, go right ahead. And what about bell peppers? You see here lots of different varieties, lots of different colors. I'm growing the, um, the lilac this year, you see a couple of them here. Um, peppers like tomatoes are really sensitive to um, temperatures. Again, um, many peppers will drop their blooms if the daytime temperatures get to be more than 90 degrees and nighttime temperatures below 75. There's kind of a sweet spot there. Um, as the summer cools, your peppers will re continue to set fruit again. Um, so just be mindful of the temperatures in your re region and consult your cooperative extension. Um, they will have far, far more information about peppers in your region. Um, so here's some resources, all of which are evidence-based from cooperative extensions that I got my resources from, and we'll share these with you after the presentation. I believe you get an email. Um, here's our little um, thing about um, justice for all. Um, I also wanted to share for those of you in Delaware that our Delaware Cooperative Extension is having a statewide training for any residents who might be interested starting on September 8th who want to become a master gardener. And I encourage you all to do that. Um, and there are, um, I don't wanna say that there aren't requirements, but um, you don't have to be a stellar gardener. Um, when I was chosen as a master gardener, I said, you guys have picked the wrong person. I really don't know how to grow anything but a geranium. 
and, um, and here I am. Um, it's a great group of people. We do a lot of great things and it's an awful lot of fun. Um, so I encourage you all. Which brings us to questions. Um, so I hope you found this useful and um, please, do we have questions? Um, before we do that, Karen, I was asked to put the slide up with the uh, post office box number on it for donations. So I'm gonna do that real quick and then we'll, oh, let, Kathy, we'll let Kathy go ahead and ask you your questions. Um, so let me get this here um, in case anyone needs to know. Um, this is our new Kent County Master Gardener PO box, which we're gonna be using for any kind of mail that you would like to send <laughs> us. Um, also, this is where we are taking donations towards our scholarships. So you'll also get this email. If you don't want to write this down right now, you'll get this address in your follow-up email also. Okay. When I removed my background. I wanted to show you my little babies. Here they are. Aww. Uh, just about ready to go out. A little too soon, but almost, almost. It was so, snowing in, in Marydale today, so I, I would hold off. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. No, they're not going anywhere anytime soon. No. Not until Mother's Day. Great job, Karen. There are, uh, there are a bunch of questions. I think that some of them probably got answered as you went through your presentation, but um, I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to make sure I don't exclude anybody. So the first question was, what should the minimum soil temperature be for transplanting outside? And I, I, I think you referenced that, but maybe a quick reminder. Yeah, at least 65 degrees for the soil. Uh, and keep in mind, the soil is not the same as your air temperature. In my experience, it often takes the soil far longer to heat up. Um, so I know here in Delaware, we had some beautiful, beautiful days where the temperatures were in the high 70s, which is great but it's gonna take quite some time for that soil to reach the temperature that's required. And too soon, you're gonna stunt your growth. So patience is a virtue. Great. And are there different seeds for green, red, orange, and yellow peppers, or is it the same fruit at different stages of ripening? Yes, different seeds for different types of peppers. Absolutely, yes. Um, for example, I should have brought my pepper packs with me. For example, my lilac peppers this year came specifically lilac bell peppers. I'm growing mini bell peppers. Um, um, and that actually comes in multiple colors, red, yellow, and green. Yeah, so you can buy different plants that will grow different colors. Um, there are some breeds of peppers where if you leave them, um, if you leave them long enough, they will change colors on the plant, but you know, you can pick them green, you know, like my jalapenos. My son-in-law likes them incredibly hot. Um, so you can pick them while they're green, but he'll leave them on until they turn red because uh, he's a glutton for punishment. Uh, so again, it's all relative to the breed you're growing, the type of pepper you're growing, and there's so many. Okay. And that same person asked if there was a charge for soil testing at UD and someone else responded that they thought it was about $17. I don't know if you know that Karen or if Megan knows how much it is. Yeah, Megan, I don't know how much it is this year. I haven't had one done in about two years. Has it changed? It is $17, that's it correct. Is. I just ordered three of them. So, um, yep, $17 each for, for home gardeners for lawn and, uh, and vegetable gardens, or um, I get one for blueberries also. Each of those is $17. Thanks, Debbie. It's well worth the investment. And you do have to order them through the University of Delaware website. So they have a page there. Um, I don't know if, Megan, you wanna put that in the chat box, uh, that you go online and order it and they mail it to you. Great. And someone asked um, how large a container is needed per plant. And I know Karen, you said you wanna have a five gallon size minimum. Is that per plant? Yes, yes. If you're planting your peppers in a pot, I would recommend a minimum of a five gallon size pot. Um, so Pots and I have a love affair. Um, I like terracotta 
in the sense that um, it's very good at wicking water if you find that you have excess water because it's a natural substance. However, they're crazy heavy. Um, so that's a challenge. So whatever pot you're planning, please make sure that it does have drainage holes because that's super duper important. And I'm assuming you're talking about um, relative to a transplant. I mean, the babies here um, are, are in, still remain in a tiny little um, pot. Um, okay. I hope that answers your question. And do, do peppers tolerate strong winds once they're outside? Ah, uh, the winds are the bane of my existence. And I, um, I changed my garden this year. I moved it to a different site and, and I know it's gonna be an issue. Um, so yes, um, yes, they do tolerate strong winds. Um, when they get larger, um, but nonetheless, I recommend a support of some kind. Um, there, as I had said previously, there's cages and they will provide limited um, movement when a strong wind comes. Um, but there's other ways to support your plants that will also provide support against the strong winds. Now, there were, there were a few questions about watering. Um, you said that frequent watering would contribute to a weak plant. Um, and so this person is asking how to encourage a stronger plant. Um, I know you said two inches of water a week, and you also right. said that the soil should remain pretty consistently moist. So, so if there's no rain, um, and you want two inches would, you know, how do you do that basically? Sure, sure. Um, so short frequent watering, so to speak. And again, keep in mind that watering is relative to your space as well. The sun exposure, the environmental conditions, you know, whether we're having super hot days or not. Um, and it's a fine line. Um, and you're gonna, you're gonna find as I have from, from my mistakes, what works and what doesn't. Um, if you can consistently provide water, I prefer early in the day, not during the heat of the day. Um, I also don't like to water late in the evening because if it's gonna be a little cooler that evening, um, although the soil will retain the moisture a little bit more, I often have concerns that that's gonna damage the plant. I would recommend watering early in the day, watering the soil directly, trying to be mindful of that two inches per week. If you find your soil is drying out and you reach that two inch requirement, if you wanna call it that, then guess what? Maybe it was a super hot day, maybe you know it drained a little too much, go ahead and water more. I would rather you watered a little bit more so that the soil remained moist than it became dry in between waterings, if that makes sense. Um, and how do you know you have too much? Well, you don't have to buy a fancy rain gauge. You can pick up the soil. And if you take a, the soil and make a fist out of it, the soil, and it stays together, then you're great. If you pick up the soil and it's draining between your fingers because it's so dry, you need more. Um, so it is, it's a balance, it's a fine line. I wish I could give you exacts, but there are so many variables, variables that come into play as well. And when you were talking about sun, um, one of our master gardeners, Janice mentioned that she has, she has a sun calculator that was not very expensive that sits in a pot of soil um, oh. where she wants to plant, she sits it in this pot of soil for 24 hours and it'll tell you how much sun you actually have. So that sounds like a pretty cool tool. Oh, I never know about that. That is pretty cool. Now there were several questions about fertilizer. So do you use a weak liquid fertilizer when transplanting outdoors such as fish emulsion? Yeah, so um, so I will do a soil test and add fertilizer based upon the soil test. Um, my thought being that 
Um, if my soil has enough nutrients, if there is enough calcium, if the pH is okay, why am I going to add more fertilizer? It's just something else to spend money on and it's not going to be needed or absorbed. So it's a waste of money. Um, further along, if I'm finding that the plants are um, not growing um, as well as I had hoped, not, um, not doing as well as I had hoped, um, it might be a time to give them an extra little squirt of calcium. Um, I will put compost, actually I already have, I put the compost in um, already, uh, and it was a fish-based compost um, into that soil to get the bed ready already, um, just because of that calcium. So, so yeah, I like, I like a fish-based, um, but if my soil test comes back and says that there's not a problem, then it's not necessary. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Somebody asked if miracle Grow liquid plant fertilizer is good for the peppers. I have not used that. Um, and um, through the Cooperative Extension, we're not, um, we're not able to recommend specific products. Um, and I do know that there are a lot out there. Again, um, it, the resources that we'll provide in the email that I have used here are all evidence-based. Um, and they provide lots of great information relative to specific peppers um, growing regionally. You can also contact your own cooperative extension because there are regional differences as to the soil types, even here in our own Delaware. You know, here in Kent County, our soil is not, um, you know, necessarily as clay-like as other areas of our state. Um, so contact your cooperative extension. They would probably have recommendations for your area that are commonly needed. And then a couple questions related to growing in a couple more about growing in pots. And I, I think, well, so if you're planting in pots and, and I think you answered this, um, I think this person was wondering, do you have to rotate them if you plant them in pots? And you suggested at the end of each season, just wash the pots really well. And so Correct. someone else asked, um, is there any, are there any special instructions about what to use when washing and disinfecting the pots? Ah, um, I use an extremely diluted um, soap and bleach solution. And by extremely diluted, one part bleach, nine parts water. Uh, and I do that in the fall uh, when uh, my plants have moved on. Um, and then rinse them off again in the spring. Uh, I might put a drop or two of um, some dish soap in there if, um, if I find that uh, it's needed for, you know, whether there was a disease for that plant or what have you, or I saw something in the root ball when I pulled them out. Um, but again, extremely, extremely diluted and well rinsed before you get your plants in. Great. And when you were talking about rotating the, the plants, do this person is asking, if you don't have any problems, do you, can you rotate them after two or three years or do you need to rotate every year? I would recommend rotating every year because when I didn't, I personally experienced the problem um, between the bacterial, um, bacterial problems and I also those darn Colorado beetles. Mm -hmm. um, so regardless, I would recommend, if at all possible, I mean, just because I had bad experiences. I learned from my own, this is how this came to be, this presentation, I learned from my own mistakes and I wanted to share them. <laughs> um, so this person I, I evidently can only water her plants from overhead and is wondering, is there a better time to water if all my watering is overhead? to help have the plant leaves dry off? Well, I guess in the morning, I would be afraid of doing it midday uh, because of the potential for sun scalding. Um, and I know I haven't used them. Uh, maybe some of my, my, my fellow master gardeners have used them. Um, I know there are devices I've seen sold, even like old soda bottles that you can put 
in a pot and fill with water so it will slowly um, drain. I've never tried that. Mm -hmm. um, maybe something like that would be successful. Hmm. Okay. Or, you know what, here's an idea. I haven't done it with peppers, but I've done it with other like house plants. Um, put ice cubes in the, <clears throat> around the soil, not touching the plant, but um, on the outskirts of the soil and that will slowly melt and will provide moisture for the soil, but you're not physically watering. Okay. Um, here's a product question. Um, this person has used serenade liquid clay spray on fruit trees and is wondering if that's sort of the same idea of what you would use for stink bugs. I am thinking so. I have not had stink bugs and I haven't used the, anything like that yet, but from um, my understanding, yes, it would be similar. Okay. Do pepper seeds need to be soaked before sprouting? This person says she's failed to sprout some indoors. No, I do not soak my pepper seeds. Um, I put my seeds in a good potting soil, uh, which is different than topsoil. Um, I use a grow lamp up above, and um, while they're germinating, they are also on a heat mat with my, with my tomatoes. Um, they need heat as well as sun to germinate. So that might be a problem. So no, no soaking, um, but again, uh, the heat and the light. Great. And this person sometimes gets small caterpillars inside the peppers at the end of the growing season. Do you have any really? idea what they might be and how you might counter them? Huh, that's interesting. I'm wondering if, uh, and I don't know, I'm wondering if it might be um, a European core borer that's a pest that can infect peppers um, that I did not talk about. Um, when they, um, obviously they start out as caterpillars, little brown caterpillars. Um, and ultimately when they emerge, um, they are moths, not butterflies. Um, they're common on corn, but they can be found in other vegetables like peppers, rhubarb, spinach, um, they will actually create a pinhole um, and they exude, um, you'd have to look very carefully that the wind or water wouldn't blow it off, but they exude like a sawdust would be evidence that they are in there um, and they will cause the plants to wilt. Um, they'll, they'll feed, they'll just have an old feast day in there um, on those pepper plants. Uh, so perhaps that is what it is. It's tough to say without looking personally. Um, if that is the issue, um, you can manage them by either um, destroying the larva, um, cutting off the actual stalk, not just the fruit, but the stalk, the branch um, that is associated with that affected area. Um, and you wanna be mindful of just seeing um, if you see that larva developing. Um, here in Delaware, you can send a sample. Are we are we still doing that now with COVID, Kathy? Do you remember? Are we are we able to send samples of plants off now, or is that on hold because of the pandemic still? So it's still actually on hold. Um, we're able to try to do diagnostics through photos, and um, you know, so if you have a problem, you take a picture, you send it in, and we try to do our best. Um, and if we cannot do it by then, we could try to arrange for pickup. But right now we're trying to remain contactless with homeowners if possible. Oh, yeah. So take a picture and email it to us and we can try and identify whatever is going on, not just with your pepper plant, but any plant. Great. Uh, Marion, one of our master gardeners, she, she asked Mr. Google and found a little recipe for that um, uh, nicotine um, solution. So maybe that's something we'll be able to send to people, um, sure. but it's in the chat session, uh, area. And I think we answered this one. Are red and yellow bell peppers a different variety from green or the same? They are different variety. You, mm -hmm. That was one of the earlier mm -hmm. questions. Yeah. And I think, let's see, nope. Whoop. A couple more. 
someone said they have had success with smaller peppers, like Thai peppers in small one gallon pots. So that's good to know. Um, Debbie yeah, they're great for um, people who are growing with a limited space. They really are. Mm -hmm. Debbie just suggests to remember that fruiting vegetables don't need a lot of nitrogen, but green leafy vegetables do. If you overfeed, they'll produce a lot of green, but not much fruit. Yeah. Someone's yeah. asking about whether you reuse the soil from the containers from year to year, and that sounded like a no. Yes, I do not recommend that uh, because there is potential for um, diseases when you leave that soil. And I appreciate that it, it's a bit of a pain but um, it's well worth the investment. Again, as I had said early, in the, early on, all of these um, little things, whether it be the sunlight and the water and the type of soil and the fertilizer, it might seem kind of boring, but I have learned over the years that it's really that upfront legwork, like changing the soil, um, that is where the success is coming from. Okay, I think that's it. Um, the person who asked about the watering overhead clarified that her garden was uh a, it was a 60 by 60 just a, mm, 60 foot by 60 foot garden and wow. trying to water without getting leaves wet so oh i'm you jealous. can always try a soaker hose um soaker hose is a, is a really good option too you know it just waters the ground it does take some time you know once you're setting it on but but it is worth it to to help reduce some diseases yes you can and you can put a timer on those uh on any hose you can put a timer so that you don't have to physically be there all the time you can set it for watering at short intervals or um or what have you to give you that that i found was a good investment made life a little easier for me which i'm all for yeah, drip yeah. irrigation is another one to consider, especially if you have a, a large garden where you're maybe planting in the ground. I know a, like traditional farmers can use, you know, plastic mulch with drip irrigation set underneath. So that helps keep retain that moisture, but then you're also watering um, under, not by the leaves. Right, exactly. Uh, two more questions snuck in here. Um, so the per when we said get rid of the old soil from your old pots, um, this person's wondering, do you do anything with that old soil? Oh, um, I can't remember what I do with my old soil, <laughs> quite honestly. But maybe um, you could rotate it in and use it in a flower pot, you know, so, so say you grew something like, you know, peppers in, in it, and you had a disease or whatever, you could maybe rotate it over and plant something different in that soil. I know that personally, I do not, I, yeah, I don't have the best practices there where I redo my soil every year because it can become expensive. But, you know, I just try to, you know, be mindful where you planted things and, and keep track of what your disease resistance was like over the years. Um, right. But sometimes right. it's necessary to redo some soil. Yeah. Or even mix it in, uh, perhaps with, with new soil, you know, one fourth to three quarters. So maybe it's not as uh, a little bit more cost efficient, um, as it were. But um, yeah, you don't necessarily have to throw it out. Um, you know, okay. be creative. And I think this is the last question. When rotating crops, what should peppers follow and what should follow peppers? Oh, interesting question. Um, well, again, I, um, I don't know if it's necessarily one thing following another. I think it's being mindful of the nightshades. Um, if you're rotating crops, um, you do not want to put your eggplants, your peppers, your tomatoes, uh, potatoes in the same space where you had any of those previously. Um, so, you know, who knows? You can put corn there. You could put peas there. You could, I mean, there's just a myriad of vegetables that you can put where you have grown peppers previously. Um, but I would be mindful of the tomatoes, the peppers, the eggplants, um, and the potatoes going in that same spot. I planted a sweet potato that Debbie, our, our uh, moderator here, uh, gave me one year in a bed where peppers were. I kid you not, it was the biggest sweet potato I ever saw in my life. It was absolutely huge. Um, so it's all relative to, to what you're growing. Just be mindful of those few in the same space. Great. Someone just post said there's a chart on almanac. Al, oh boy, I'm having trouble saying the word. 
almanac.com about rotation succession. So that oh. would be kind of fun for people to check out. There and you that go. Is the, that's, those are the last questions there, Karen. Great job. Wow. Yeah, well, was, thank you all wonderful. for coming. Happy Earth Day. So informative. Mm. Oh, I hope so. Again, I learned from my mistakes. You know what, we're master gardeners, but we're human. <laughs> yeah, no. that's how we all learn. Yeah, yeah, well, thanks again. Debbie, did you have anything else to close? Just everybody, you'll get that follow-up email with all the information and uh, hope to see you guys next week for our green bean uh, presentation with Larry and Leslie Cook. Um, and we are, we are officially halfway through our Veggie 101 series. So um, it's been fun and hopefully we'll be able to do this again, maybe next spring. Um, it's been, it's been a busy time. <laughs> yes, it is. Busy Thank time you. for gardeners. Thank you, Karen, Kathy, and Debbie. Today was wonderful as always. Thanks, Megan. Oh, thanks Thank for the you. support. See you Take guys care, soon. everybody.